clap your hands if you know that the mercy of God endures forever. Come on and clap, clap, clap your hands, all ye people. Open up your mouth like a trumpet in Zion. Come on and say something to the Lord this morning that lets him know that his mercy endureth forever. Hallelujah, and we're glad about it. Hallelujah, glory be to the name of God. We give his name thanks, and we give his name praise. Glory be to the name of God. I greet you this morning with divine love and with Jesus' joy in the only name that matters, Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. For it's in him that we live, move, and have our very being. Thank God this morning for all of you who are here in the house of the Lord this morning. I want to thank God for uh, the officers, the members, amen, and friends of this great church, the Galilee Church known as Holy Ghost Headquarters. It is good for us to be here, hallelujah, and be on this high and holy mountain. To our guests today, Pastor Lydia, thank God for you and for being here. And Sister Stafford, good to see you as well, amen. And to uh, Pastor Lydia's husband, thank God for you and your presence. I also want to acknowledge the presence of my sister, uh, Dr. Celeste Shelton Harris. God bless you uh, this morning for being here. And what can I say, amen, about our pastor, our leader, Bishop Michael T. Scott the first. Amen. Thank God for him. Amen. And for his ministry and for his life. Amen. He is our leader, the visionary uh, that God has given. Amen. In this season to this place. And we thank God for him and all God is doing in his life. I'd like to invite your attention to um, Judges. Judges chapter 7. I want to continue in the vein of our Back to the Basics uh, that we've been studying uh, for some time now. I think that it has been helpful uh, as a reminder for some of us of those uh, Bible stories that we learned some time ago. And for those who are new to the faith, this is a great introduction, the journey, the introductory journey to what the scripture has to say. So this morning, I want to invite your attention to Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7, and I'm going to begin uh, at verse 1, when you have it, say, I have the word. If you don't have it, say, wait on me. All right, Judges chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. We're there quickly. Amen. Praise God. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Feel free to read from any version or translation that you may have. And here's what the word says. The word reads on this wise. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moray in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let them turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. Verse 4, But the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I shall say to you, This one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. Now I want you to go down to verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had posted the watch. And they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. 
Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Verse 21, and every man stood in his place all around camp. And the whole army ran and cried out and fled. When the 300 blew their trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. And the army fed, fled to Beth Acacia, toward Zarah, and as far as the border of Abel, Melahah, by Tabah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We honor you and we give you praise. We thank you for your word today. And we thank you that it is, oh God, what we need. God, we thank you that you're giving us manna from heaven, manna from high. God, we just pray that you would have your way. Use me for your glory. Hide me behind the cross. Set my tongue on hollow and fire that the people of God will see none of me and all of thee. It's in Jesus' name that we believe that signs, wonders, and miracles shall follow your word. We thank you and we give you praise. Our hearts and souls say thank God. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Uh, in the presence of the Lord. Glory to God, I want to this morning share with you uh, from this particular thought, when less is more. When less is more. Throughout the scriptures, we see God uh, using the unlikely. God using ordinary people to accomplish his will and to do the work of the kingdom. Uh, you all remember David? Even David's father didn't believe that he would be a king. I mean, after all, he was just a shepherd boy. But when God looked at David, he saw a man after his own heart. You remember the woman at the well? Uh, she uh, had been through a few things. She had been through multiple unsuccessful marriages. And at the time that she met Jesus, she was living with a man that wasn't her husband. Now, other people would not have chosen her to do anything significant. But when Jesus saw her, he empowered her to take the gospel to her town. God is a master at using the most unlikely. He can turn the ordinary into extraordinary. God's power can take the life of someone who was on the outside, may, who on the outside may look very uh, unimpressive or may not look like they could do very well, but when they align themselves with the way of God and with his will, they are able to do extraordinary things. Well, the life of Gideon is similar. The life of Gideon is an example for those uh, of you who desire to be used by God. When we first encounter Gideon and company at the well of Herod, I want you to know that Herod is where they had set up their camp. And we know that biblical places, biblical names and destinations have meaning. And so Herod actually means fear. So Gideon and company had set themselves up in a place of fear. Hmm. The Valley of Jezreel, which stretches across central Palestine from the Jordan to the Mediterranean, separating the mountain ranges of Carmel and Samaria from those of Galilee. The ancient river there, the Kishon, which flows westward to the Mediterranean, at one point was the most important uh, area for transportation and trade through the Mediterranean coast. You see, the Midianites were attempting to develop a trading empire to gain control over this land, which would give them dominion from Egypt to Mesopotamia. The story of Gideon is found um, in Judges chapter 6 through 8. And in your leisure, I encourage you to go and to read uh, Judges chapters 6 through 8 so you can get some more information about Gideon. Gideon's name itself means he that cuts down. Uh, the book of Judges covers a 300-year period filled with the children of Israel going through the same cycle, the same life cycle, being played out over and over again. See, Gideon was a man himself that had fears and had doubts and felt confusion and despair. As a matter of fact, his own father had turned away from God and had turned to worshiping idols. As a leader, Gideon was dealing with God's people and their cyclic patterns. Uh-huh. 
God's people would be doing well. You know, the Lord would be blessing them. All their needs were met. Uh, their bills were paid. Their kids were acting right most of the time. Glory to God, they were in a good relationship. Everybody was booed up. And everything seemed to be the way it was supposed to be for the most part. Their lives were filled with sunshine and roses. Then the people would turn away from God, probably because everything was going well. But before long, when life would begin to take a turn, as the enemy would come in and oppress them, they would cry out to God for help. And God, because of his loving kindness and tender mercy, would come in and respond to their cry and send deliverance. Life would be good again, and the cycle would repeat. Uh, when things are going well, uh, some people don't have time for God. Does this cycle sound familiar? I know you don't do it, but do you know some people that when everything is just right, when their needs are met, uh, when their tax money comes in and they're hood rich and ghetto fabulous, they don't have time for Jesus. They just have time for their friends and time for the things that they want to do. But then, but then something happens. Things take a turn, and then they need the Father. When life starts, life, and they start crying out to God for help. We see them in the sanctuary only when they need help, only when they're in a crisis. And I want to challenge us to let's normalize consistent relationship with God. Let's make it a regular thing that we don't just come to church or we don't just come to worship when we need something, but that we are consistent in our prayer life, in our devotion, and in our sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. In today's text, we find in Judges chapter 7 that Gideon is ready to fight the Midianites, but for this battle, Gideon had to strategize in a different way than he had in times past. We have to be mindful that even when God places us in positions of authority, we have to remember that he's still the one of in charge. Just because God gives us a place and a title, a nice C-suite, a corner office, just because God promotes us from where we were to a supervisory position doesn't mean that we're in charge. As a matter of fact, the first thing I want to share with you this morning, that when you are working for the Lord, the first thing you must acknowledge is that it's less of our agenda and more of God's agenda. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So as the story continues, God spoke to Gideon and he told Gideon, you have too many people with you. Hmm, that's interesting. Most of us, when we have a lot of people with us, when we have a lot of people hyping us up, when we have a lot of people in our corner, when we have a lot of people showing up for us, that makes us feel good. But God told Gideon, you have too many people that are with you. I thought about this thing. I said, uh-oh, this is about to really rock some people's world. Is it possible, is it possible that you have too many people? Uh, with you. I'll come back to that. And, and the reason God told Gideon that you have too many people with you is because if I let you fight the Midianites with this group of people, the Israelites will think they did it themselves and they won't give me credit. <laughs> They'll take the credit for themselves instead of giving glory to God. Uh-huh. So what I want you to do is we're going to have to go through a process of selective service. We're only going to be able to use a few good men and women in order to carry out this battle that is ahead of you. Uh-huh. So the first thing uh, that he told him to do. So so the first thing I want you to do, Gideon, is tell all the people <laughs> who are afraid <laughs> that they can leave. Mm -hmm. Everybody that's scared. You may go home. I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, that whether or not you realize it, we are at war. Every day as we live and breathe, there's spiritual warfare that is taking place around us. Whether or not you admit it, you are caught in between good and evil. There is a war that has been going on long before you were even born. Now the thing of it is, it has already been predetermined who will win in the end. But in the middle, there are some battles that we have to go through. 
Now, as we go through these battles, strategy is provided to us by the Father himself that we might have good success. But when we are fighting, we want to make sure that the people who we are fighting with are really on the same team. Can I charge you that sometimes because somebody's beside you, it doesn't mean that they're with you. There have been some people in your life and in my life that have stood right beside us. They've been there every step of the way. They've seen every hurdle. They've been there for every turn. But there's a difference between standing beside me and being with me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When someone's beside you, they have an eyewitness account of what's going on. They can see it and they have a choice to make as to whether or not they choose to get involved. But when somebody is with you, how do you know somebody is with you? That when somebody is with you, whenever something is happening, they have a response, glory to God, that lets you know that they stand in support of what's going on. And so in the midst of having all of these people with him, Gideon said to them, everybody that's afraid, you can go home. Could you imagine if you said to the people in your life, listen, if you're afraid of the devil, if you're afraid of the enemy, if you don't want to deal with this stuff that I'm dealing with on this level, you need to go home. Can you imagine how many people would walk out of your life? But the thing is, if you want to win this battle, it's time for them to go home. Some of us are carrying some luggage that we don't need. It's called excess baggage. People who can't go with us into this fight that we're in. You're wondering why you're struggling to get over some things. You're even experiencing some hurt, some heartache, some indigestion, an upset stomach. And may I charge you, but sometimes it's because of the people who are with you. Mm-hmm. But there has been an eviction notice for those who are dealing with fear. This is not the place for you. And so, wow, imagine Gideon when he said, if you're afraid, go home. Do you think he thought that 22,000 people would walk away from him? And he still has a battle to fight. All right, so Gideon listened to God. 22,000 people walked away. <laughs> but then God said to him, bring the people that you have left. He had 10,000 people left. He said, okay, bring the people you have left to the water, and I'm going to test them at the water. So he brought 10,000 people uh, to the water. Now Gideon is thinking, okay, okay, I lost 22,000. I still have 10,000. This can still work. Uh huh. But then God says he's going to test these people and decide who stays and who goes. So God said to him, come on and bring them down. So, so here he is. He still had 10,000 men. God said, I'm going to sort out who stays, who goes. I'm going to divide them into two groups. The ones who cup their hands and lap the water out of their hands like a dog go in one group. And then the other group of the people who kneel with their mouth to the water, go in another group. So when we looked at what happened then, 9,700 of them knelt down at the water while there were only 300 people that lapped uh, like a dog. And you would say, now come on now, I'm going to get on my knees. I am not going to be lapping like a dog. Mm -hmm. But look at this. Keep this in mind, those who were kneeling demonstrated that they would be tired, that they would just go down, that they would just give up, and they would just seek to themselves their own refreshment. But those who cupped their hands and lapped like a dog, they were still in a position to move. They were still in a position of readiness. They could still see what was happening around them even though they were in a place of refreshment. Well, there were only 300 lappers, and so God said, that he was going to make an army out of those 300. Uh -huh. God said, I'll take the 300. And many, many times we've been conditioned to look for or want to take the larger numbers or to take more because that is in our nature. But in this season, what God is doing with us is that he's doing more with less. My brothers and sisters, God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. We have to get out of his way and let him lead us to victory. 
Imagine what Gideon was thinking. He was down to 300 soldiers. I'm sure he was more than nervous considering that the Midianites had 135,000 soldiers. But Gideon had 300 soldiers and faith in God. Uh huh. It was time for Gideon to move forward with the strategy that God had given him. And the next thing that I want to charge you with this morning is that when you're serving the Lord and working with him, it's time for less talking and more listening. Less talking and more listening. God was in control. Looking from a carnal perspective, it didn't really look like things were going well for Gideon. It looked like he was set up to lose for the beginning. The Israelites were outnumbered, but they had a leader that was submitted to God and following his lead. And may I tell you that as long as you are in a place where you're following a leader that's submitted to the will of God, to a leader that lives a a holy and godly lifestyle to a leader that's connected to God and following his word, God will take care of you and your leader. Glory be to the name of God. God confirmed that Gideon would be victorious. And so I imagine that Gideon in his mind was worried. He was worried that it wasn't going to work out. He was worried that he only had 300 men, but he trusted uh, what God said. Glory to God. Gideon still had to do what God had called him to do, even though he didn't have what he knew his enemy had. Have you ever been there? God asked you to do something, but you didn't feel like you had the tools, the skills of the equipment to do what God had called you to do. And so God told Gideon to take his servant and go to the enemy's camp. This is crazy. Now he already only had 300 people against 135,000 people. And then God said, well, I want you to hear something. Go down to the enemy's camp. Don't go in, but on the outside. And while you're there, I'm going to let you hear something. Glory to God. Gideon went and did as the Lord told him he went to the camp and stood on the outside of the tent and as he was there he heard the testimony of a dream one of the soldiers inside the Midianites camp had a nightmare he had a horrible dream and he was telling this dream to his fellow soldier uh, he was there and he was saying that I just woke up from this terrible nightmare I can't believe that this happened oh my god he said that I was dreaming that there was a, a barley loaf that came into the camp and it hit the tent and the tent fell flat. Oh my goodness. And I just can't believe it. And everything was destroyed. And so he was telling his fellow soldier, we're in trouble. And I don't know why I had this nightmare, but I know that that meant that it was nobody but Gideon, the son of Joash. And right there, Gideon heard for himself the confirmation that the victory had already been won. Gideon heard right there that it was a done deal. Even with only 300 soldiers, it was confirmed that he was going to win the victory. You see, barley or a barley loaf, and we see that in the scripture, this is what poor people ate. This was, you know, not Panera bread, but this is that regular bread. That bread to get you from day to day, you know, light bread. Glory to God. The barley loaf symbolized poverty. And what God was demonstrating through that dream was God was going to take poverty and turn it into power. He was saying, where you come up short, I'm going to make up the difference. Not just in money, but in skills and materials and networks and connections. So I want to say to us this morning, that be mindful that in this season, God will allow your enemy to confirm your victory. Many of us are looking for a prophetic word from our favorite prophet, our favorite uh, YouTube prophet, our favorite TikTok prophet to give us a word from the Lord. We're looking in familiar places for God to say to us things that we want to hear. But let me charge you that in this season, open your ears and hear more of what your enemy is actually saying. I can't hear nobody. 
A lot of times we dismiss what our enemy has to say because they dislike us. They don't want us to advance. They don't want us to prosper. But every now and then, you have to pause and listen to the prophetic words of those who do not like you as they tell you who you really are. There are times when those who hate you will propel you prophetically into the future that God has for you. There are times when people who can't stand you will bless you by reminding you of who God has called you to be. There are people who won't help you that will say words that remind you that God has not finished the work that he started in you. In other words, what I want to say is, is that there are times when your enemy will speak and they're actually telling you and confirming that what you heard from God is true. That what he said is the truth and he's going to do just what he said. Uh Uh-huh. Uh Uh-huh. God is going to give you victory and there's nothing that can be done about it. God is going to deliver what you need right in to your hands. I know it doesn't seem like it's going to work out. I know you don't feel like it's going to come together, but God has already worked it out for your good. Well, it's time to get ready to go to the new disciples reception. So the last thing I want to say, uh, thirdly and finally, is that when we're dealing with God and he's moving us from victory to victory, the third thing it calls for is less worry and more worship. Less worry and more worship. Now, armed with confirmation, Gideon was completely ready. When Gideon heard the dream of this particular Midianite, and as he was sharing it with the other person, uh, he did a thing. Uh, Most of us, if we would have heard uh, what was said, we would just take off running and go back and tell everybody, it's over, I won. But notice in the text it says, when Gideon heard this, he worshipped. Now, why would Gideon be on the outside of his enemy's camp, uh, you know, ear hustling to get some intelligence that only God can give? And then when he got the confirmation from his enemy (laughs) that everything was going to come together, the first thing he did uh, was give God worship. And I don't know about you, but every now and then, instead of running and telling everybody about what God is getting ready to do and letting everybody know all of your business, you ought to stop at the place where he confirms what he said and just worship the Lord. Hallelujah, the Lord is a spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's not always about the telling, but sometimes it's about the time that you spend in a worship with God. This is how you know Gideon was truly connected to the Father because even in the midst of his own doubt and fear, he followed his instructions and then at confirmation, he lifted up his hands. Is there anybody in the sanctuary this morning? I mean, you have some struggles, you have some fears and some doubts, but you've Taking time to come into the house of God this morning. And while you're here, you might as well just worship. Worship him because of who he is. Worship him because he's God. And besides him, there is no other. Worship him because his name is great. And he's greatly to be praised. Worship him because all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise is due his name. I'm not talking to people that just worship God when things are going your way. But I'm talking to a few people that even in the midst of a rocky time, you still lift up your hands and give God glory. I'm talking about people. People who are sick in their body, you've been diagnosed with a condition or a disease, but nevertheless, you give God a worship because it belongs to him. And as you worship him, his presence is made manifest in the midst. Glory to God, is there anybody here this morning that says, I just want to be in the presence of the Lord. Forget about yourself. Concentrate on him and just worship and give him praise. Forget about their neighbor and the person beside you. Forget about the people in the online audience, but just lift up your hands and give God worship. Lift up your hands and honor him because if it had not been for the Lord who was on your side, the enemy would have swallowed you up. But thanks be unto God who's given us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's worthy of our worship. And if you want to overcome that thing that's weighing you down, that thing that you're supposing is going to take you out, that unexpected turn, stop worrying and start worshiping. All you got to do is put God in front of what you're going through. Put God at the forefront of your problem. Put God at the forefront of your sickness. Put God at the forefront of your battle and he'll make everything all right. Less worry and more worry.
worship. So Gideon, he, he worshiped on the spot. And then after he finished worshiping, because let me tell you something, when you get finished worshiping, worship is activation for what's coming next. You want to know what some people's secret sauce is to their good success? They're a worshiper. And they don't wait until Sunday to worship. They don't wait until the praise team gets up to worship. They don't wait until they get to Galilee to worship. But every day is a day of thanksgiving. And when they wake up in the morning, they worship the Lord. They bless his name and give him honor because it's due his name. And you're wondering how can they smile all the time and they don't even have that much. How can they be so happy and I have more than them? How can they be so glad and they drive a raggedy car? How can they be so happy and they don't own a home? Honey, if you just worship God. One thing have I desired of the Lord and that will I seek after. I'm not worried about this other stuff. You can have your high car payment. You can have your $5,000 mortgage. But baby, just as long as I've got Jesus. Ain't no way I want to have all these things and not have Jesus. That's a recipe for misery. But as long as I've got Jesus, I've got more than enough. That's why I can smile when I don't have what you have. When I don't drive what you drive. And I don't live where you live. But guess what? As I begin to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, as I worship God and put him first, all these other things shall be added unto me. And when God gets ready, honey, he'll put me in the neighborhood he wants me to be in. He'll put me in the car he wants me to drive. He'll send me to the places that he wants me to go. And when I get there, I'll still give him worship. I told you in the beginning, the problem is when saints are happy and have everything they need, they forget about God. But when things take a turn, they want to run and cry out. But as we normalize less worry and more worship, God can use us for his glory. Now, when Gideon finished worshiping, he went back to his 300. Uh huh. And he went back and he executed the strategy. Can I tell you that when you leave worship, you ought to have a strategy for living. Every Sunday when you come to this house, whomever is preaching the word of God is giving you what you need to make it through the next week. People that get up here and preach aren't preaching for their health. They aren't preaching to be seen. Tell you the truth, this is a hazardous work. Can you imagine all of the darts that have to come at the person who's preaching the word in order to get it to you? Can you imagine what the preacher is going through? No, you can't. So let me tell you, in order to proclaim the word of God, there are things that you have to suffer through to get the message to the people. It starts with you. There are sacrifices that have to be made. There are battles that you have to fight in order that the word might be delivered. And so it behooves us when the man or woman of God is standing to proclaim the word that we are attentive and that we listen because we're getting what we need in order to do what it is God is assigning our hearts and our hands to do. Uh-huh. That was for free. So what I'm saying to you is that after he came out of worship, he took an action. Gideon went back to the 300 with a renewed sense of vigor. He went back to the 300 with a renewed zeal. When you leave church today, you ought to leave out of here a different way that, than you came. When you leave out of church today, that thing that thought that it had you, you got to loose it and let it go until you will not have my mind. I'm no longer giving you my attention because God has given me a strategy for success. Less is more. So Gideon divided the 300 soldiers into three groups of 100. And so here it is, and I'm almost done. It's time for us to go. This is my first close. Uh-huh. So he told the 300, we're dividing up in groups of 100. And what we're going to do is we're going to go down uh, to the Midianites' camp. Now, in order to fight, all of us know you need some type of weapon. In order to fight, no weapons had been mentioned to this point, but now weapons are being brought into play. The weapons that were distributed were very interesting. Um, um, Gideon didn't give them 
regular weapons to use. Uh, he, g- he gave them, um, this is, the, I know the 300 were like, okay, he, he, went, he went to the enemy's camp. He said he worshiped, but then he came back crazy. He, he said, I'm going to give you a pitcher, meaning a clay pot, uh, with, with a lamp in it. And they go in your left hand. And I'm going to give you a trumpet in your right hand. All right, all right, all right, hold on. 300 people against 135,000. And we're going with a lamp, a pitcher, and a trumpet. Now, if that were you, uh huh, if that were you, um, you would be like, Gideon, I love you, bro, but this ain't it. <clears throat> And I value my life. I love the Lord. But um, this ain't working for me. But what I love about it is in those 300, none of them refuse. Nobody said, I'm not doing it. Nobody said, I don't want to hear it. Nobody said, he's trying to kill me. Everybody took what they were given and followed their assignment. God is looking for a few soldiers. That even though God might be asking you to do something that seems absolutely crazy to other people. But because God has given your leader divine strategy, when God says, I want you to build affordable housing in your neighborhood, and I want the housing to belong to your church and not to other people, God will give you a strategy to raise the funds to do what people say can't be done. And it'll belong to the kingdom, and community people will be blessed because it belongs to the people, uh, belongs to the kingdom. Glory to God. So he gives them uh, unconventional weapons, uh, a lamp, oh my God, uh, a pitcher or a clay pot over the lamp in the left hand and and, and a trumpet in the right hand. I want to believe that the lamp reminds me of in Matthew chapter 5 when it says, ye are the light of the world. Uh, A city that's set upon a hill cannot be hid. So let your light so shine that men, women, boys, and girls may see your good works, but glorify your Father which is in heaven. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. That, that reminds me of that uh, when it talks about the light. So, so we get in there, and, and there's a set of instructions uh, that goes with this. So you got the pitcher uh, with the lamp inside and the trumpet. And so Gideon gives them the strategy. So 300 surround the camp of 135,000 with a lamp, with a pitcher in their left hand, and a trumpet in their right hand. And Gideon says to them, do as I do. Uh huh. And so once again, they're following instructions. They're, they're, they're following the leader. And he says, when I blow the trumpet, all who are what with me, look at verse 18, not beside me, all who are with me, then you also, Blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and save the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Uh huh. So they came to the outpost of the camp, and what they did was he blew the trumpet and they did likewise. Imagine this 300 trumpets blowing. You know, think about the Midianites were not paying attention, 135,000, and they hear 301 blaring trumpets then Gideon told them the next thing I want you to do is I want you to break your pitcher Hmm. okay so so they blew the trumpets 301 blaring trumpets then they broke the pitchers think about the sound of breaking ceramic in addition to blaring trumpets How many people do you think that the 135,000 people heard? So as they uh, broke the pictures, then the lights begin to show through because the light was no longer covered. Come on, somebody. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. So what are you trying to say, Lady T? What are you talking about? I'm talking about now it's time for you to break your picture. When I say break your picture, I mean it's time for you to let your light shine. 
In Joel chapter 2, it says, Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound the alarm on the holy mountain and let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh and at hand. It's time for us saints to break our pitcher. Not only break our pitcher, but blow our trumpet. Somebody said, blow your trumpet. Understand this, that in breaking the pitcher, the sound that was released in the atmosphere sounded like there were so many more soldiers than there actually were. And once the pitchers were broken and the pieces fell apart, the Midianites that were in the camp began to run because of this terrible sound that they heard. I want you to know that it's also time for you to break your pitcher. It's also time for you to sound your trumpet. It. Because when your adversary hears the sound of the trumpet blaring and hears the sound of the pitcher breaking, they will know that they have been defeated. Come on, somebody. They have been defeated and even in the midst of that, you're letting your light so shine. In the midst of breaking the pitchers and blowing the trumpets, in the midst of all of this darkness, light has come forth. And I want to say to us that in the midst of these spiritual battles that we are facing, in the midst of times when culture has taught us that more is more and more is best, God is saying to us that in this season, my son and my daughter, I'm about to do something in you that you've never seen before. I'm about to do great things with just a few people. I know people like things large, biggie, and extra large, but in this season, small is the new big. God is doing things in the midst of people that come from small beginnings. God is doing things in the midst of people that are dealing with small resources. God is doing big things in the midst of people who are least likely and unlikely. How do you know lady T I know because I see it every day God is doing miraculous things with the minimal God is doing things that are great and it's coming from places that are small and people are wondering, how can you do what you have done? I've never heard your name before, Pastor Lydia. I didn't know that you were a movie producer, but God is putting you in a place. Hallelujah, glory to God. It doesn't matter who didn't know you last week, but in the days to come when they speak your name, speaking your name will open the doors to do what God wants to do. When people see the movie Granny's Place, when all of us go to the movie, we'll tell somebody else. And in the midst of of our sharing disciples will come into the kingdom that's breaking the picture and let our light shine glory be to the name of God when we let our light shine we're allowing God to be seen on us and in us and through us it's not about us but it's all about him is there anybody here this morning that came to Galilee understanding that you're in the fight of your life and you didn't know that you needed these type of weapons you thought you could go and get you some help from taking in a class to teach you uh, how you can use a weapon. Maybe you tried to sign up with Vivid Armor so you would be prepared to fight the next battle. But I want you to know this morning that Vivid Armor can't do it for you. Glory be to the God and we love them. I want you to know that you can't do it for yourself. I want you to know that your mama can't help you with this. Your daddy can't help you with this. But it's time for you to break your picture. It's time for you to blow your trumpet. It's time for you to stand up and face the enemy that has been taunting you and teasing you and telling you that you're not going to make it and telling you you won't have good success that has been teasing and aggravating you, that's been making you doubt what God told you. I want you to know that doubt is the dark room where negatives are developed. And if you want to come out of the negatives, you're going to have to come out of the dark. Come on in to the light children walk in the light beautiful light come where the dew drops of mercy shine bright shine all around us by day and by night Jesus the light of the world come on anybody know Jesus is the light of the world he is the light of the world oh my God lift up your heads oh ye cakes and be ye lifted up ye everlasting doors and the king of who is the king of glory? The Lord God strong and mighty. The Lord God mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, all ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors.
loves. What we need is more of Jesus. We need to break our pitcher and blow our trumpet. There is a sound that defeats your enemy every time. When you break your pitcher and blow your trumpet, you're letting the world know that you serve a God who is able to deliver even in tough situations. You ought to blow your trumpet. That means open up your mouth and tell somebody what God has done. You need to blow your trumpet. That means stand on the word of God. Decree and declare what he said. Decree and declare that what God has for you, it is for you. And what God has for me, it is for me. Blow your trumpet and give God praise. Even in the sanctuary, let everything, let everything, let everything that has breath, praise ye the Lord. Praise it with the cymbals. Praise it with the hot sounding cymbals. Praise it with the timbrel and dance. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Is there anybody in Galilee that came to blow your trumpet? Anybody in Galilee want to sound the alarm of victory? Anybody in Galilee convinced that God is using what you have to do what needs to get done? You may not have 135,000 soldiers. You may not have $135 million. But what you do have is you have a pitcher and you have a lamp and you have a trumpet. Come on, Galilee, and blow your trumpet. Blow your trumpet. Know who you are in Christ. Know that the scripture says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I don't care what it is. God will give me what I need to accomplish the set goal because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. When I step on the scene, I'm not showing up by myself. You might laugh at me because all I have is a pitcher and a lamp and a trumpet in my right hand. But you don't know like I know when I blow my trumpet when the light of life has come God is able to do what no other power can do glory to God I know when I blow my trumpet that no weapon that is formed against me will be able to prosper and every person every tongue that rises up in judgment against me shall be condemned when I blow my trumpet I acknowledge that I am more than a conqueror through him that loved us, that I am who God says that I am, and he is perfecting in me that which he began a long time ago, that it is his desire that I am the head and not the tail, that I'm above and not beneath, that you are the lender and not the borrower. God is giving you exactly what you need, so blow your trumpet, less is more, more of his grace and less of us. Second Corinthians chapter 12 says, my grace is sufficient for you and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. That means when you think you can't go on, when you think it's over for you, all you have to do is blow your trumpet and the grace of God and the power of God and the love of God and the spirit of God will show up and show out. Is there anybody in Galilee who wants to blow your trumpet? Come on and open up your mouth. Come on and decree and declare that he is Lord. Somebody say yes. Somebody say yes. You make a way out of no way. Blow your trumpet. He'll open doors that no man can open. He'll even close some doors that need to be closed. He'll start some stuff that nobody else can start. And glory to God, he'll finish some stuff that needs to be finished. Is there anybody in Galilee that wants to blow your trumpet? Because even though you might have less than somebody else with God, it's more, it's more. It's more, come on and blow your trumpet. Come on and shout unto God. Come on and bless his name. Say yeah, say yeah, say yes. Blow your trumpet. Blow your, he's undefeated. The God I serve is undefeated. He's never lost and he never will. And just as the 
Midianites ran out of that camp because of what they heard. I want us to make a sound in this place that's going to drive the devil crazy. On the count of three, I want you to scream in this place. I want you to shabak, hallelujah, and let the devil know we have the victory. One, two, three, blow it. you 
I want you to touch yourself on your chest, put your hand on your heart, and receive the renewal that God is giving right now. We're going to blow our trumpet in this place. Come on and decree and declare. We had the victory. We had the victory. We had the victory. To everyone who's weary, for everyone who's worn, for everyone who feels defeated, we're lifting up our voices right now. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we're asking you to move in the sanctuary of Galilee now. We're asking that fire would fall from heaven and fall among your people. God, we're asking right now in the name of Jesus that you would heal and deliver. We bind up the hand of the enemy. Oh God, that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God, he's already defeated. Oh God, we stand in victory now in the name of Jesus. God, we believe you right now that souls are being transformed, that lives are being changed. God, we believe you now. Oh God, that you're working. Come on and pray, church. Pray right where you are. Come on and open up your mouth and pray. God, we thank you for breakthrough right now. Oh God, we thank you. Oh God, we thank you that you're moving everything that's not like you in the name Jesus. Oh God, we cry out to you right now. God, we cry out, Abba Father. Abba Father. Abba Father. You know what we need. Oh God, before we even ask for it, you know us so well that you know every hair that's on our head. Now God, in the name of Jesus, heal and deliver. Set free by the power of your spirit. In the name of Jesus. Oh God, we come against every plan, every scheme, and every wicked accusation that was designed to destroy us, that was designed to distract us from being who you have called us to be. God, we walk in the authority and the power that you have given unto us. God, we thank you and we give you praise. Hallelujah, glory to God. Oh, right now, God, that your word, oh God, that as it goes forth, it's going to accomplish what you set forth for to accomplish, that it's going to do what you call for it to do. And as we blow our trumpets, as we decree and declare, as we cry out to you, oh God, because of your loving kindness and because of your tender mercies, we will not be consumed. And God, as we thank you, we seal our prayer with the clapping of our hands and the lifting of our voice. And God, we tell you, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're doing right now. And thank you for what you're going to do in the days to come. Because eyes have not seen, neither have ears heard, nor has it entered into the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls. What you're going to do in the life of these your people? Now bless them, God, just because I asked you. God, I know I hear your voice. And God, I'm your servant. But I'm asking you to do something extraordinary in the lives of the people in this room. And don't do it in the dark, God, but do it out in the open so men might see, so women might see, so boys and girls might see that you get the glory out of our lives. It's in the name of Jesus. It's in the name of Jesus. It's in the name of Jesus that we bless you and we thank you. We count it done by faith. Come on and clap your hands and give God the glory.
We have the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There's nobody like him. Nobody can do what he can do. And I thank him and I bless his name that even with less, honey, we're doing more in 2024. <laughs> and I thank him and it shall come to pass in Jesus' name. There might be here somebody that's here this morning that doesn't know this Jesus that we're so excited about. We want to offer you Christ this morning. Our deacons are in the aisles. We want to offer you the opportunity to join that great army of soldiers that are in the army of the Lord. Jesus is undefeated. He's never lost and he never will. But today we offer you Christ. Lady T, what do I have to do? To receive Christ all you have to do is acknowledge that you're a sinner believe that God raised Jesus from the dead confess that with your mouth and just like that you're saved and you're sealed until the day of redemption you don't have to be perfect nobody's asking you to be perfect but God will work on you to perfect you perfect means mature so he will mature you in grace and in faith when you give your life to him 
Maybe you're here and you're already saved, but it's been a while since you've been in fellowship with God. You want to come back to him. You can come back to him today. Just slip up your hand. Raise your hand. You don't have to come up front. The deacons will come to you and say, I want to rededicate my life to the Lord. If you're watching online, scan the QR code that's on the screen. Scan that QR code and we'll have our discipleship team to reach out to you. This is the most important decision you'll ever make in your entire life. That's the decision to follow Jesus. Jesus said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That means if you follow him, he'll make you a disciple maker. He'll let you bring other people to him to experience the joy, the love, and the peace that can only come from you. Now, just because you, you receive Christ doesn't mean that your life will be perfect. You're still going to have to go through some things, but you won't be by yourself. He won't just be beside you. He'll be with you. Emmanuel means God with us. You'll never be alone another day in your life if you receive him. Come to Jesus. Or maybe you're in need of a church home today. You're looking for a place that you can worship and fellowship and have a family of believers supporting you praying with you and praying for you. Raise your hand if you want to join this branch of Zion called Galilee. If you're online, you can join as well. Put it in the chat. Put it in the comments below. I want to become a part of this fellowship. Come to Jesus. He's waiting. Because God is the greatest power. Never be defeated. And he was God is the greatest power, we shall never, never be defeated. We would stretch our hands toward this section right over here. I want to pray for Sister Miles, Father, in the name of Jesus. Comfort her heart, strengthen her touch her right now from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. Lord, we know that all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and to them that are the called according to your purpose. Touch right now in the name of Jesus in only the way that you can. We know it's so and it shall be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Thy will be done on earth as it already is in heaven. Thank God in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Come on, clap your hands and thank God. Hallelujah. There might be somebody else that's standing in need of prayer. Slip your hand up if you're needing prayer this morning. Amen. We're going to close in prayer with you. Amen. Anybody? And I'll put my hand up because I need it. Anybody else want to join me in prayer? Lift that hand. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the prophetic word that you've given to us this morning, that less is more in 2024. Lord, I thank you for the barley loaf. I thank you for the 300. Lord, I thank you for what looks like a minimum amount. I thank you for the small and humble beginning. And I thank you that you're able to take that and turn it into something great. I speak over every hand that's held those who responded in obedience that we might touch and agree in prayer. And I pray that we leave this worship space better than we came, stronger than we came, brighter than we came, that we might go forth and blow our trumpet, break our picture in the name of Jesus. Thank you now, God. Hallelujah, that you are in control. 
and that you are in charge. And no matter what it looks like, we don't walk by what we see. We walk by faith and not by sight. It's in the name of Jesus that we come together in prayer, praying for this body, praying for this community, praying for this family, praying for this church, praying now for every hand that was raised and elevated as we touch and agree. Those that are at home right now that are stretching their hand toward the television screen, I pray now in the name of Jesus, oh God, that they would experience the God of less is more in 2024. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, thank God. Amen. Now come on and clap those hands and say, never be defeated. God is exalted. Jesus is Lord. Come on, somebody. Oh, bless his name. The devil is defeated. Messenger, Dr. Tamara T. Scott, what a word. Less is more. Amen. And we thank God for the word and we pray that we not just be hearers of the word, but that we be doers of the word just the same. To God be the glory for the great things he has done. Thank God for the lives of those who are giving their lives to Christ online and those in person. And thank God for those who have been blessed. Uh, by coming to church this morning and allowing the worship service, amen, to bless you with a strategy for living this life as you leave this place, amen, but never leave this place the same, amen. I want to acknowledge this morning on our way out, amen, brother, uh, brother Mike Abbott has a guest with him, Pastor Robert Davis, amen, that's with us. Would you stand, Pastor Davis? Let's give Pastor Davis a round of applause. Uh, our guest today, thank you so much for being present with us and for being here this morning. And uh, we say to God be the glory for the great things that he has done. And we're just so delighted to have you in the service of the Lord on today. And also another uh, young man who is an evangelist, a man who attended Galilee as a child, a man. And he was with us at 730. And I'm not sure if he's still here with us. Uh, William Coleman, amen. Is he still here with us this morning? He was here for 7.30, and he stayed for Sunday school. Let's give him a round of evangelists. William Coleman grew up at Galilee and was worshiping with us this morning, amen. And so we thank God for his uh, presence on today as well. As all of our guests and all of our friends, we thank you so much. And Pastor, amen, we're looking forward, amen, to next month and what God is going to do. But we know this is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. We're going down from this place, but certainly not from his presence. I encourage all of you to be safe this holiday, uh, the Independence Day, July 4th. Whatever you're doing and wherever you're going, 
Amen. Take the name of Jesus with you and be safe, and uh, we will see you when you return. Amen. Don't forget, we have our new disciples uh, reception. If you are a new member, a new disciple, amen, the last 12 months, since June up until the present, and you've become a part of this family, we've got uh, some special recognition for you. So after the benediction, don't linger long, but go right into the fellowship hall, and uh, there, Sister Margie Williams, amen, will receive you, and we'll be glad uh, to be able to welcome you formally and officially into the family. All of our elders and ministers and clergy, amen, will put on aprons, amen, and hairnets, and we're going to be serving our new members today, and I'm going to lead the way, amen, praise God, amen. A call to elevation is a call to wrap the towel around your waist and to serve, amen. So don't say nothing to me. Don't say, Pastor, Bishop, you ought to go sit down, go sit at the head table. No, I want to serve. Amen. And I want our new members to see that if the bishop can serve, amen, chicken and meatballs, come on somebody, fix somebody's plate, that's what I'm expecting you to do for each other. Because Jesus served his disciples by washing their feet. Peter said, come on now, Deacon, you're going to stir me up. I'm getting ready to holler like Lady T. Holler. Amen. Amen. But Jesus told Peter, I'm going to wash your feet. Peter said, you'll not wash none of my feet. Amen. Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you're no parts of me. He said, if you want to be great, you got to serve. And a whole lot of folk want to be great and they want to climb up. But don't nobody want to serve. Come on, somebody. Everybody want to be seen. Come on, somebody. But nobody want to be seen serving. Come on, somebody. You want a new title, get down on your knees and serve somebody else. Come on, somebody. You want to be promoted, you want to be elevated, but you got to take some time and be willing to be a servant leader. Amen. What kind of church would we have if everybody started serving? Serving on your job, serving in your community, Serving in your school, serving in the church, serving in your neighborhood. Oh, to God be the glory for what he has done. Let us all stand as we prepare to dismiss from this place, but certainly not from his presence. God be praised in this place. Let's receive the benediction. Is there anything to claim my attention to, Deacon, Deacon Gardner? We're all good. We're all straight. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Health fair. Yes, thank you to the Praying Hands for Health Ministry for a wonderful health fair on yesterday. Where's Sister Cat Haley? Thank you for you and your team for blessing us on yesterday. I saw the pictures. I was not able to make it. Amen. I was in the airways heading back, but I heard about it, and it was a tremendous success. And we have to focus not only on our spiritual health, but our physical and mental health and well-being as well. Thank you, Galilee, for the way you served this week, our church was being rented by our Hispanic brothers and sisters of the Iglesia Church over on Gall Road. They have a small building. Matter of fact, that's where Galilee used to have church. Amen. On Gall Road. Amen. And they're occupying that building now, but they hosted their national convocation here. And I mean, every seat was filled. Come on, somebody. And we hold 1,200 people. And they, every, I've never seen this church that full, amen, since Lady Bell's funeral, amen. But there were so many people here, amen, and it was a time that was had in this place. And they did some praying up in here, some jumping and shouting. Black folk ain't the only one that can shout and jump and holler. Come on, somebody, amen. We had a, they had a time this week, and I feel the prayers of the saints. Come on, somebody. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, they were laid out in the floor. Come on, somebody. They fell out in the, come on, somebody, all up in the pulpit. I said, you, you all go ahead and consecrate this church. <laughs> come on, somebody. Leave some of that Holy Ghost for Sunday. And certainly they did. And Lady T just walked right in it. Come on, somebody. And allowed the Holy Ghost to use her in a mighty way. Thank you for the way you allowed the Holy Spirit to operate through you. And we appreciate your ministry, as well as Minister Al Maria Miller. Amen. We've got the best in Galilee. Come on now. We don't have no slouches. Come on, somebody. You don't, don't sleep on them. Amen. Because they have the Holy Spirit. Let's look to the Lord and be dismissed. Father, we thank you for what our eyes have seen, what our ears have heard, and what our hearts have felt. Thank you for the movement of the Holy Spirit all week long with the Iglesia Church and spilling over the residue is here on Sunday. 
But when we came in here on Sunday, we felt your power and your spirit. Yokes are being destroyed in the name of Jesus. And thank you, oh God, that fetters are being broken and chains are being shattered right now in the name of Jesus. Those who at home are watching online are still trembling, oh God, because of the Holy Spirit moving in their house, moving in their living room. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for the souls that have been saved, lives that have been touched, oh God, bodies that have been healed and minds that are being regulated even as I pray this prayer and speak this benediction. I thank you, oh God, for Galilee and I pray that you continue to take us higher and higher in you. Oh God, and we'll be so careful to submit and surrender and to continue to serve as you will see fit. Now we ask that your grace, your mercy, and your peace, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with you now, henceforth and forevermore. All of God's children said, thank God, amen, and amen. Look at somebody, tell them God loves you, and so do I, and there's nothing you can do about it. Go in peace. Be blessed. Amen.